everyone, and welcome to today's Artwork Archive webinar, Charitable Art Donations, Advice for Donors and Accepting Institutions. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we brought together, the Artwork Archive team has brought together a panel of experts to discuss best practices for donating and receiving fine art and collectibles. This presentation is both for the donors and the receiving nonprofits, so museums, universities, and the like. A few things before we get into the content, a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, this webinar is being recorded, and we will share the presentation uh, within the next day or two. It'll actually be probably Thursday as I am offline tomorrow, but you will receive an email with the recording and the slides. We have saved time for your questions at the end of the presentation, so please submit your questions and comments using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you're on an iPad, you can click the three dots on the bottom of your screen. And please use chat for technical support. The Q&A Q is for us to consolidate all the questions so we don't miss your wonderful inquiries versus chat. Great for getting to know you and sending any tech support that you need. My colleague Cassidy will be online to be of help. If you need access to captioning, you can click live transcript on your bottom panel, then select show subtitle. The automated transcript is available to those on Zoom desktop or the Zoom mobile app and is available if you're on the 5.0.2 version or higher. As I mentioned earlier, I'm thrilled today to be joined by this esteemed panel of experts. I'll be serving as moderator. My name is Elysian McNiff Kogelmeyer, and I am the head of growth at Artwork Archive. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, for those that um, have limited visual um, ability, I am a fair skinned redhead wearing a light pink shirt, and I'm sitting in my home office with a very stacked bookshelf behind me. I am located in Denver, Colorado, and I want to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations. A little bit about me. I'm also the daughter of artists, art therapists, art educators. I've devoted my art career to the arts uh, since graduating college. Um, I've worked in both the for-profit and nonprofit sphere, uh, sphere, working as a curator, running a public art program, writing for art publications, creating online art classes. And about seven years ago, I started with Artwork Archive based here in Denver, Colorado. A little bit about our panelists, which I will introduce now. So Michael Darling is co-founder and chief growth officer of Museum Exchange, a position he has held since March 2021. From 2010 to 2021, he was the James W. Alstorff chief curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. From 2006 to 2010, Darling was the John and Mary Shirley curator of modern and contemporary art at the Seattle Art Museum. And from 1998 to 2006, he was associate curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Darling received his BA in art history from Stanford University and his MA and PhD in art and architectural history from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Darling frequently serves as a panelist, <laughs> writer, lecturer, and guest curator on contemporary art, design, and architecture. Melissa Passman is a senior associate with Day Pitney LLP. She represents clients with federal and state tax matters, including international and domestic income and transfer tax planning for entities and individuals. With experience both in private practice and in-house, she strategically advises clients with a holistic view of client issues and concerns. Melissa has extensive experience in art law matters, drawing on her experience with a major international art gallery and other art institutions to counsel collectors, advisors, galleries, tax exempt organizations, and family offices. Melissa advises these clients on matters around the acquisition, ownership, and disposition of artwork, including on the formation of private museums and other charitable vehicles, as well as multi jurisdictional tax planning. Melissa remains involved with arts organizations and sits on the boards of Carolee Schneeman Foundation in Inner City Arts Los Angeles. 
Tara Konzowski is the founder and principal attorney of Konzowski Law, an all-woman boutique art law firm. Tara has dedicated her career to working in the arts and has over 15 years of experience in both the for-profit and nonprofit sectors of the art world. Serving as outside general counsel to museums and other nonprofit cultural institutions around the country, she advises clients on a wide variety of arts-related legal matters and transactions, including contracts, intellectual property, tax acquisitions, risk management, and NFTs. So a wealth of knowledge and experience when speaking today about charitable art donations. Thank you to the three panelists in advance for the wonderful content you will be sharing. And a little bit about who is presenting this webinar, who is Artwork Archive, or rather, what is Artwork Archive? For those new to us, Artwork Archive is an online art collection management system used by organizations, individual collectors, and artists to organize, manage, and showcase their artworks. And we produce a lot of free resources like today's webinars, other webinars, articles, and e-guides. So for those of you that are already on our platform, thank you uh, for, for supporting and joining us. And for those new to us, um, hopefully you enjoyed today's presentation. So there are a lot of moving pieces when it comes to planning, coordinating, and accepting donations. Uh, we'll start at the beginning. So how do you begin the process for making a gift? Luckily, we have a professional matchmaker with us today, Michael. <laughs> and without a without oops, and with that, I will let you get into your part of the presentation. Sorry, realized I was muted. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks, Alicia, for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here with Tara and, and Melissa too. Um, so Museum Exchange is a, is a newish company. As you can see on the slide, we were founded in 2022, but really launched publicly at the beginning of 2021. And the main goal was really to try to open up the possibilities of philanthropic donations of art. So to really help people that maybe, um, maybe they're in a, a certain city and, and the museum there doesn't collect the, the same kind of things that that collector collects. Perhaps there's already redundancies in their local museum with the things that they collect and that museum's not interested in taking the, their gifts. We really help to open up um, opportunities for other museums elsewhere around the country that could receive those gifts and really make use of them. So it's something that, and, and the primary um, vehicle that we use is a digital catalog that we issue every quarter. Um, every quarter it's brand new with, with fresh material and we um, that that catalog is only viewable by museum professionals. So right now we have over 200 museums around the U.S. and some in Canada that are looking at this catalog every every three months, every quarter. And when they see something they like, they write a proposal that goes to the donor, and then the donor really chooses which museum makes the best case for that piece. Um, we've we started another network, a parallel network of hospitals, libraries, and universities last summer to really increase the potential for finding, um, making and finding matches between donors and their artworks and institutions that could receive them. So that really opens up a lot more opportunities. If, if for some reason we don't make a match on the museum side, oftentimes we can put it in front of this, this what we call healthcare and education sector. Um, but some things just are more appropriate for that sector uh, right from the beginning. So um, we really saw a ton of growth once we um, increased you know, added that to our portfolio last year. And um, right now we just launched our, our spring catalog, which has almost two, 120 pieces in it, which is our largest catalog thus far. Um, and so we're really excited about just this nice steady growth that we have uh, going behind us. And, um, you know, really doing all of this by word of mouth, there's very little advertising or marketing that we've done so far. So it's ju just tapping into the this, this wonderful network of of the art world to get the message across. Um, it's this was um, it was interesting to put this up because the actually the donor of the sculpture um, is on the call today, which is really exciting. Um, but this is just one example. Now that we've been doing this for two years, the the whole process, the whole gift process, has played itself out, and and gifts have made it through the accession process at the museum. They've gotten into uh, the, the registrar's hands for conservation and cleaning. And then they're starting 
their way into the galleries. And so this sculpture that you see in the middle here is by Richard Hunt. Um, and this is hanging in the, the brand new galleries of the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. So when they reopened their building, uh, actually it was a new building, an extension that Annabelle Seldorf did. Um, this is their, their kind of one of their classic post-war galleries where you see the Barnett Newman back there and the Leon Polk Smith and, and other artworks. And this Richard Hunt, um, great African-American sculptor based here in Chicago, um, was not in their collection. So they were able to bring this into their collection through Museum Exchange, put it on view and automatically start to tell a broader history of, of art from, from this post-war period. So uh, it was a real success story for us. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't have, an, there's another slide from the adjoining gallery of a great painting by Ethel Fisher, who, whose donor is also on this call, as it turns out, which is, was great to see. And if I would have known that in advance, I should have put that slide in there too. But um, we have these fantastic donors all across the country, some international as well. And, um, you know, we're helping them to, to really maximize the impact of their, of their art gifts as they go to these different institutions across the country. Um, large and small in every corner of the country. Um, and uh, we can really take a, a, a wide range of material, although primarily so far it's been modern and contemporary. Um, we do see opportunities to expand that to other genres and time periods, but um, for the time being, it's it's been mostly modern and contemporary, although we, we never say no. So if folks uh, on the call have things that they're looking to donate, we can always find or almost always find a solution for you. So. Um, as as um, you can see here, you know, we've had an incredible uptake from the museums themselves. You know, basically this it's free art that's being made available to them, but they're also being introduced to patrons that they might not otherwise have contact with. So, you know, and, and again, from all across the country. So a collector in Los Angeles might donate something to a museum in Nebraska that museum never would have had that contact to make. And um, once, if, if the donor was excited and happy with, with that donation, other donations could follow. Um, so it really starts to, to open up geographically the potential for, for gifts to flow um, here and there. And, and the other thing too, it's a lot of, I think we'll probably get into this um, with Tara and, and Melissa, but sometimes people in their in their planning, their estate planning might say, I want it to go to this X museum without maybe even having a conversation with that museum to know that they even want it. So this uh, really allows us to, to find museums that will take that work to really have a very clear plan in place for people. Um, and, and also the other thing too, is that th these artworks aren't being forced on any of these museums. There's not a, a a uh, kind of influential person twisting the arm of the museum to take this. These museums are proactively telling the donors they want this. So it really means that this is work that will get shown uh, and be used and um, and not just languish in storage. Hmm. I love that. And I have a, a follow-up question for you, Michael. So you address the previous geographical limitations that sometimes are in place um, when it comes to donations and how um, your platform solves that. And then also the, the twisting of the arm. So perhaps, you know, um, removing the uncomfortable place that institutions may be in if they are being forced a, a donation that they doesn't fit within their mission, et cetera. Are there other challenges that were faced either by the donor or the collecting institutions uh, that you wanted to resolve when you uh, founded Museum Exchange? Well, um, you know, one thing that is that museums have, a, or almost all of them have storage problems. They, they're at capacity, so they're becoming extra selective and choosy about what they do accept as, as gifts. So, so this, again, kind of unlocks that when, when a museum, you know, and a patron that, that might already have a relationship and they just can't take it because there's no space, we can find a museum that would take that work and, and make, it, uh, make it useful. But like you were saying too, you know, this is a great off ramp for curators to say, you know, this isn't right for us, but you should talk to Museum Exchange. They could really help find a, a, um, a fit for this. And commercial galleries are doing the same thing as, as sometimes collectors come back to them with pieces that they might have bought from the gallery. Some, oftentimes they'll ask the gallery if they would help find a museum for that donation, which is a lot of work. And 
um, the, the gallery can also just refer them right to us too, so that they, you know, preserve their time and their kind of personal capital and in, in trying to chase down a, a, a possible gift, they can just flip them right to us and we can take that on for them. Using the, the power and the efficiency of our network to, to get that work out in front of the, the, the largest number of possible um, recipients. And, and oftentimes these are museums that are not the ones that are being covered in the art press that are still doing fantastic work, have great collections, have beautiful buildings, um, but they're not the ones maybe that people think of right away. I mean, here you've got the Albright Knox and the MFA Houston um, saying how much they like museum exchange, but there's also a lot of other uh, great museums that are just, you know, not super well known out there that we've been able to tap into. And, and of course, um, you know, there's folks on the call too from museums that we're not working with yet. And so we're constantly reaching out to new museums and um, signing them on. So uh, so that's something that, you know, we continue to grow every, every quarter, probably at least 20 or 30 museums every quarter that we add to, to the network. Great, thanks. Yeah, and um, one question that's actually immediately connected to that is I'm asking about if there's any cost for museums to utilize museum exchange, because for those that may be smaller museums, they may not have the budget, correct, right, to pursue um, something like this. Yeah, we have a, we have a, an annual subscription model that we use with museums. And so any, any museum user can sign on and look at our catalogs for free and keep looking, you know, month after month if they don't see anything that they like. But when they see something they like and they pursue it and they're, and they are successful in getting that that work, then we would invoice them for an annual subscription fee, which allows them to make unlimited proposals for four uh, consecutive quarters. So uh, it usually you know, pays for itself right away. Um, we do have a sliding scale. So museums that are at or below a $5 million annual operating budget pay $1,500. Museums between five and 15 million pay $2,500. And the museums that are above $15 million operating budget pay 5,000. So we really um, you know, wanna make sure that the, and, and I would say that the bulk of our museums that are participating are at that $5 million or less. So, so there's just, there's very few that are really in that, in those big mega budgets, these two, you know, whose who uh, quotes are on here would be among them. But um, so we, we want it to be as democratic as possible. And if even the $1,500 is um, too much for a museum to figure out in their budget, we've found ways to even solicit donors to help cover those costs too. So we really don't want that to be a barrier, but we we kind of want the museums to have a little bit of skin in the game too. No, that, that's great. Thank you for sharing. And I see there's other questions, which we will address um, at the end of the, the presentation. So I want to make sure we have time for um, our next two, two panelists. Um, Thank you, Michael. That was really lovely for you to share. And similarly for us at Artwork Archive, uh, we recognize the importance of supporting the, the little guys in the smaller museums, which, which we do a lot here too, as well as the, the bigger guys. Um, so now for the collector's perspective. So the donor making the charitable gifts. And with that, I'll hand it over to Melissa. Hey, thank you very much, Elysian, and thank you, Michael, for sharing about museum exchange. Um, so I will be talking about the collector's perspective and the donor perspective also in terms of artists. Um, I think it's always important, you know, when we're talking about charitable deductions, maybe to ground ourselves in kind of the different types of tax that we're talking about. So, you know, I think most people think about it in the income tax context, and for a lot of people, that's the only one that really matters. Um, so I will go into numbers later, but, uh, you know, that, that's a little background. And then there is also a parallel tax, and that's the gift and estate tax. And there's a federal level gift and estate tax uh, where the current exemption amount is about uh, $12.9 million per person. Uh, so you do not have to worry about a taxable estate unless your assets uh, are on your date of death or six months after are uh, at least that amount. Um, I should note that there are also some states that do have a state tax as well, including New York, um, Connecticut actually is the only state to also have a gift tax, and then those thresholds can be lower. So uh, this could be applicable even if you don't find yourself 
uh, in that federal estate tax zone. Um, so when thinking about donating art generally, uh, you know, because we are in tax world, yeah, you know, there are several requirements here and different ways to go about making donations. Um, from the income tax side and the estate tax side, or even for gift purposes, uh, you know, it's really important to have an appraiser. And appraisals come in different forms. Uh, you know, of course, when we're talking about an income tax deduction, people want the highest appraisal possible because they're looking to offset any income tax. And in the estate tax con uh, context, you know, people want a lower value to decrease the value of their estate. Um, and there are uh, different ways that uh, values can be measured. Uh, that's probably a whole other uh, conversation, but you know, there are definitely there are ways that certain discounts can apply and you know, other methodologies. Um, one thing that I think, uh, I think anybody should be aware of is that the IRS um, does have this art advisory panel. So if there is artwork involved that is over a certain threshold, I believe it's currently $50,000, um, there's a panel of arts professionals who will look at that deduction or look at that appraisal and determine if it really makes sense. You know, and again, you know, people have different uh, motives for wanting a certain number. So the art advisory panel does not know the reason for the donation, so they can try and take a more objective view. Um, just in her, and as far as making any kind of gift, uh, whether a lifetime or a death, you know, Michael mentioned you know, perfectly that you, know, you definitely do not want to catch an institution by surprise. Uh, that is that can end badly, um, especially depending on these kind of document um, that the gift is contained in, such as a will. Um, and you can always negotiate these gift terms with, with the institution, which Tara will certainly talk about uh, next. Um, yeah, and uh, on the donor side, you know, there are a couple of considerations. Um, you don't want to hold on to something uh, so much that you would prevent the IRS from recognizing that a donation has been made. Uh, that's really important. Um, you know, I think in most cases, you know, it won't be an issue, but of course, you know, some donors want to uh, have certain strings attached and the IRS might look at those strings and say, you haven't really given anything up in the end. Um, so that's uh, an important piece to that. Um, there are different ways to go about making your donation, whether it is for income or gift and estate tax purposes. Um, you can go directly to the institution or use museum exchange. Um, there are kind of more advanced planning vehicles, uh, such as charitable trusts. Um, there, you know, there's all these different acronyms. Uh, there's charitable lead trust, charitable remainder trust. Um, those it require a more careful planning and there are a lot of rules around them. So it's really important to review any plan involving that with an attorney. Um, and you know, there are you know, ways to contribute artwork to a, to a charitable trust and the trust then goes on to sell the work and that can have other tax advantages. But again, there are a lot of rules around this and it's really important to make sure that you comply. Um, another popular vehicle you know, uh, is a donor advised fund. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, financial institutions have this option now. Uh, Fidelity, for example, um, I think they have a pretty low minimum uh, amount uh, to do that. So you create your own account uh, with an institution such as Fidelity and uh, you can claim an immediate deduction uh, at the time of the donation. And then those funds uh, will sit in that donor advised fund and you can then advise that institution to make a distribution to a charity of your choice. Uh, so the point being that you give up control right away, but there still is this opportunity to direct. And uh, one advantage of a donor advised fund um, is that it's considered 
a public charity, which I'll go into in a second, uh, and it has a more of an, of an advantageous uh, deduction associated with it. Um, so uh, just to reiterate uh, a little bit here, just about uh, just being clear um, on what the differences are between an income tax deduction and an estate tax deduction. Um, one big difference is that for income tax purposes, the uh, donee institution needs to be domestic. Uh, that's why you'll see um, you know, American Friends of organizations, for example, those are set up to receive donations, you know, for an organization such as, you know, the, the Tate or the Sancho Pompidou. Um, so American donors can still receive a tax deduction and support that institution uh, in that form. Uh, there is not the same kind of restriction on uh, estate and gift tax purposes. So, uh, you know, it's always important to, you know, having step back and think about, you know, what are you trying to get out of this donation? What is the identity of the organization? Um, and, you know, where, how, where do they operate and uh, what their tax classification might be? Um, yeah, and... Uh, there are in your estate planning documents, you know, if you are thinking about uh, donations in association with your estate planning, uh, you certainly uh, want to make sure you've identified the recipients properly in your documents. Um, you want to make sure that if for some reason that recipient is not in existence at the time uh, when the document becomes effective, that you provided for some kind of charitable backup um, or that you've otherwise given whoever your administrator, you know, whether it's an executor or a trustee, you've given them some flexibility to go ahead and make any other uh, updates uh, or choices uh, that, that might be needed there. Um, you know, I think depending, I, yeah, depending on your collection, there is um, the opportunity to form some charitable foundations as well. Uh, you know, some people form private museums um, or they'll form a charitable trust. Um, so in terms of the calculations here, uh, I should step back. So within the 501c3 world, uh, there are different uh, classifications of organizations. So kind of the two big buckets are public charities and private foundations. Uh, so for public charities, that means that their public support uh, comes from a diverse range of donors and they're not really reliant on you know, one or two uh, kind of big donors that way. And it's a complicated calculation as well, but uh, that's, that's the most uh, tax advantaged. Uh, then in the world of private foundations, which are funded by an individual or a small group of individuals, uh, you know, I think the IRS, you know, takes the view or, you know, when legislation was passed that, you know, they wanted to be more careful about how these are regulated. Um, and one part of that is that the uh, income tax deduction, uh, you know, is lower if it's considered um, what's called a non-operating foundation. So that means it's really a grant making organization and they don't carry on their own activity per se. And if there is an operating foundation and they are carrying on their own activities and uh, operating in a, you know, doing the work uh, that is consistent with 501c3 work, um, there is a better tax deduction available, and uh, that will put you pretty much on par with a public charity. And then within the income tax deduction world, uh, there's you know, different uh, kinds of property that have uh, different uh, advan threshold advantages associated with them. So right now, cash is you know, kind of the most advantage. Um, you can deduct 60% uh, of your adjusted gross income or up to 60% if you make a cash donation. Um, there are other 
categories on the big catch all is really uh, tangible personal property and other capital gain property. So NFTs do get included in that. You know, the IRS uh, still counts them as collectibles. And uh, I'm sure several of you have had to uh, report that on your income tax returns, you know, use it, using that collectible category or as, as a property category. Um, so in this case, uh, you know, what the main threshold that's usually used is that there is a deduction allowed for 30% up to the fair market value. Um, this would be supported by an appraisal if it is uh, more than $5,000. Um, and then um, otherwise donations to private non-operating foundations are limited just to 20%. And uh, as I'll talk about in a second, uh, there is a difference between uh, something that's inventory or self-created versus what is a capital asset. And then for state tax purposes, the donation um, decreases the value of the calculation of your gross estate. Ooh, that was really well laid out. I know, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a lot. Um, so I think uh, it's really important here uh, to be aware of some of the issues uh, that can come up, you know, because while the guidelines actually are a little loose per, uh, and in some way, you know, there are certain formalities that, you know, the IRS will not uh, negotiate on. And, you know, it might seem maybe obvious sometimes, but uh, there were two cases last year that actually showed, you know, or and acted as a reminder that, you know, these formalities are important, otherwise you will not get a deduction. Um, so it's, uh, really important to um, remember your form 8283 filing. Um, so that is something that is going to go along with your tax return. You identify the value of the property, you identify the recipient. Um, in addition, uh, you would always have the, uh, what's called the contemporaneous written acknowledgement. I'm sure Tara can tell you more about how institutions you know, deal with it on that end. And uh, you would also attach your appraisal. Um, it's also important to remember the related use requirement because uh, if, if the property is being donated to an organization that won't actually you know, use it in its intended way, uh, it does not get that same advantage. So, you know, you, you donate an art or, um, you know, to, you know, something totally, you know, different that's not, a, where it won't be on display or could be on display or couldn't be used in some educational manner, then uh, that would also cause the IRS to uh, raise its eyebrows and say, you know, you're not getting that full 30%. So you can get some deduction, but you're not getting that full deduction. Um, and then finally, it's always important to be aware of the quid pro quo. Um, in that way, the, um, the donor is not, you need to make sure you're not getting something in return that is of that value. So something that I think you know, a lot of us have probably dealt with are charity auctions. So you know, if you're going to buy a work at a charity auction you and you win, uh, you are getting that artwork. And unless you uh, vastly overpaid for that artwork and you can prove that somehow you overpaid, you know, perhaps you can get the excess as a deduction, but um, you yeah, that you got something in return, and that's uh, just what it is. So uh, always something to be careful of. A very good example. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> uh, do we the, cover everything on the the collector side before getting into artist estates? Oh, uh, uh, sorry. Oh, I did, we, did we did did we get through all of the collector focus? I know there's a lot we could we could pick Melissa's brain for you know hours, uh, but uh, just because we have limited time, uh, I also want to make sure Melissa has uh, an opportunity to also speak to the artist perspective, artists estates when it comes to making charitable gifts. Yes. All right. Yeah. So yeah. Lastly, um, yeah. So for artists, 
And there is a difference, as I mentioned before. Um, so self-created works, uh, you know, are considered inventory, um, you know, for income tax purposes, you know, it's ordinary income and not a capital asset. So this carries over into um, charitable deductions for income tax purposes as well. So I'm sure, um, you know, a lot of people have heard about this, or maybe they tried to do this and encountered this the hard way that, um, if an artist donates a work during their lifetime, you're limited to your tax basis um, in that work, and that really just means the materials. Um, but the difference that occurs is at death, that artwork is um, going to receive what we call a step up in basis, meaning that it goes to its fair market value. And if there are any estate taxes or uh, any other uh, taxes to offset where a charitable donation can help, that will be much more advantageous than trying to donate during lifetime. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, you know, for artists, uh, you know, you, you uh, own the copyright in your work unless you have uh, disposed of it otherwise in some way. But, um, you know, you always would want to clarify any kind of agreement, um, estate planning documents, uh, you know, however you go about making this donation, uh, you want to be clear what rights are you donating? Are you donating a physical object? Are you also donating the copyright? Um, and this actually makes a difference because there's a, a split for income tax purposes versus estate tax purposes about how um, that gets valued. So uh, for income tax purposes, if you didn't donate the copyright, uh, that actually would not necessarily be a completed donation at that point. Uh, That's really helpful. And in line with, um, we produce a lot of resources. I've led some webinars and we have articles about planning your estate as an artist and thinking about the IP and the, the copyright too, along with the, the physical artwork. So appreciate you mentioning that as well. Exactly. So if, um, maybe more I if, could say, but that's what I've got. Yeah, I know, and I love <laughs> um, and if, uh, again, if you have questions uh, from Melissa, feel free to put them in the, the Q&A. She can reply via chat, um, via the Q&A uh, chat box, or we can pull them up at the, at the end um, for our Q&A session. And then uh, lastly, uh, the institution's perspective, which Tara will present. And I just have to say that this webinar, I got really excited about it because usually we do our webinars like in silos. So webinars for artists or webinars for uh, for organizations, collecting institutions. And I love that we get the whole ecosystem here together. So those making the artwork, purchasing the artwork, collecting it, um, and then stewarding it like the museums, et cetera, that Tara will now speak to. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Tara. My pronouns are she, her. Um, for anyone visually impaired, I'm fair skinned with blonde hair in a dark green blazer. And I am sitting in my home office behind me. This is, uh, there's a picture of Ruth Bader Ginsburg taken on her first day on the Supreme Court in front of the Supreme Court. And then I've got some original watercolors of some of my favorite museums. You might be able to tell what they are. And um, as Elysian mentioned at the beginning, uh, my firm represent, we serve as outside general counsel to museums around the country. So I actually started working in-house at a major modern art museum. I saw that museums have this huge legal workload, complicated agreements to negotiate, such as those with, uh, with donors of art. And so I started my firm to provide cost efficient but specialized uh, transactional legal services to museums. So I'm super happy to be here today. Um, to talk about the institution's perspective. So you're a museum. A donor wants to give you a piece of art. Great. You can accept the gift. The donor receives a tax deduction and you move uh, along your way, right? Eh, not so simple as much as we all wish it was. There's a few things you know, that Melissa's already touched upon that Michael has touched upon that are gonna come into play. One of the things and the biggest responsibilities on the museum side um, is the documentation of any gift. And the, the most important of that is the deed of gift. So here we've just outlined a few of the, you know, the, the heavy hitters you wanna make sure are included in any de deed of gift if you are the receiving institution. And that's to, you know, first ensure that the legal owner is the party signing the deed of gift. Um, so we've seen, for example, uh, a donor 
sign a deed of gift, um, giving a piece of artwork to a museum, only to find out later that, you know, a, an, an entity that the donor owned was actually the owner of the work. And so we have to go back and correct the deed of gift and make sure that the correct entity um, is on that deed so that title passes to the museum. The other thing, and you know, Melissa and I might disagree on this bullet point, um, is to avoid language that limits or restrict the gift. So from the museum's perspective, uh, when we are receiving gifts, it's really important that they are as unrestricted as possible so as to not uh, limit um, the museum's operations in any way. And the reason that this is so important for the institution is we're really thinking into the future. We're thinking 50, 100, 200 years down the road, wanting to be able to use this gift um, to fulfill our mission as it might change over the years. And so when gifts are received with really tight restrictions, it might impede the institution from doing so in the future just to understand our perspective. Um, and then something else that's typically in a deed of gift is um, regarding board approval. So a lot of museums have uh, very specific accessions policies and collections management policies. And part of those policies are often that any gift must be approved by the board. So it's really important that we include that language in our deed of gift so that the donor is fully aware um, that their gift might be subject to a collections committee or board of trustees approval. So this I wanted to include, you know, when Melissa and Michael and, and Elysia and I were talking, you know, one of the things that come up most often is on the museum side, when we are working with donors and we want to um, court them as much as possible and make the donation as easy for them as possible because we're so grateful for the gift. We often find that donors are asking the museum for tax advice, and it's really important that museums remember that they should never provide donors with any form of tax advice. Um, long story short is it could jeopardize your 501c3 status. Um, so we want to make sure that museums are never discussing the deductibility of the gift with the donor. You know, that is for the donor to discuss with their excellent tax advisor, such as Melissa Passman. Um, and it's really important that museums not communicate to the donor the value of the artwork. This is a really big one. Any valuation is the donor's responsibility. And um, you know, museums are not in the business of appraising work and therefore should never be providing a value of any artwork to a donor. So on the next slide, you'll see acknowledgement letter requirements. And so you'll see what's not in here is the value of the work, just to piggyback off the last slide. So the IRS has um, lists requirements that should be included in any acknowledgement letter. So the acknowledgement letter is once you've, you've received the work, you've received the, de the deed of gift, the institution should then send an acknowledgement letter back to the donor and that acknowledgement letter is, is used by the donor for tax purposes. And the basics that have to be included are the museum's name, a description, but not the value of the artwork. And then either a statement that no goods or services were provided by the museum in exchange for that donation, or a description uh, and estimate of any value of the value of any goods or services provided by the museum to the donor in exchange for that gift. And then next. So as an institution, you know, again, it's wonderful to receive these gifts of art and um, but there are some things to consider. So, you know, Michael mentioned one earlier about the storage. Do you have the ability to store the work? You know, another more over, our overarching question is, does the work fit within your collection? Um, you know, do you have funds to maintain the work? And then are there any restrictions on the gift? Because these kind of factors will determine whether um, the institution can really be a faithful steward of the piece. Uh, you know, things that are not included on this little list here that Melissa alluded to is also there's this, you know, the IRS does have something to say about it as well as far as the related use test. Um, Melissa highlighted that if you're a museum accepting the gift, unless you have made it very clear to the donor that you will be auctioning that gift, you know, it's not something that you should sell because it impacts the donor's tax deductibility. Um, so those are a few other things that aren't bulleted here to think about. Tara, I have a follow-up question because actually sure. 
within the Q&A, there was a question about uh, mm -hmm. if you could provide or and or Melissa, any examples of restrictions that come up around gifts that you have seen? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, uh, I give this artwork to the museum and I require that it be on display 85% of every year that the museum, you know, like that is just, um, that's a big requirement. Museums are rotating their gallery spaces. Um, so that's a restriction. Uh, another restriction could be it is only displayed um, with works by the same artists, say, right? And maybe the museum's trying to do a show where they want to present it in a unique perspective. And so again, we're trying to make sure there's no restrictions that limit uh, limit the museum in fulfilling its mission, which is 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 broader than that one piece of work being donated as much as we want that piece of work to be donated, if that makes sense. No, exactly. And the importance of a partnership and communication throughout yeah. all this process. Yeah. And often when we do get a restriction request, we, you know, as again, as someone who represents the museum, I'm never saying absolutely not. I work with like, what restriction can we get to that helps meet what the donor's asking, like the spirit of what they're trying to achieve while also letting the museum continue to do its job. Yeah, no, that's great. And um, I have a slide later. Um, I interviewed a number of museums, mostly academic institutions around um, posing the question of is a gift truly a gift or can it be a burden, you know, if, if those restrictions are laid yeah. out, don't have those conversations. And so a lot of the great content that you are sharing, um, uh, there's also some real life scenarios and tips from yeah. directors as well. Something, something that we've, sorry, I'll do one well, something that has become, um, a, we've been seeing a lot more often is that when a donor is giving, and this is more when they're giving a large collection, say, not just one piece of work, um, when it is a situation where it might be a bit of a burden on the institution to process the entire collection, photograph the entire collection, Matt, whatever it be, the donor is actually also giving a sum of, you know, cash mm -hmm. along with the collection to help alleviate that burden to the institution to make it a mutually beneficial arrangement. Absolutely. And I see that in conservation as well. Yeah, that's a great point. So for those that um, will be donating, perhaps consider that it was more than just one piece. Um, I wanted to quickly um, spend some time, just a few minutes to show those that may be using artwork archive, or if you have an art database, you know, this discussion of whether you are a donor, a collector, an artist, um, or a receiving institution, the importance of keeping track of all this information, all of these details. Um, you know, speaking of, you know, Tara said 50, 100 years down the road, um, you know, an institution may have questions about a donation. Um, and so making sure that there is information track that you can pull up to make choices um, or prove a standpoint or just communicate with the IRS in a very <laughs> easy diplomatic uh, clear way. I'm sharing my screen to show a collector account. So for those that are donating, you are uh, donating at this is the same for collectors and artists. Um, it's very easy for you to a track what you have donated. As you can see, there's this donated label here on pasture seen by James Hart. But also you can keep track of, you know, who you donated it to, those appraisal values that are on your end as the donor, not necessarily the museum's end. Um, but to show really quickly. If I click into this piece, Ocean Life, you can see that you donated it to Greta. And who is Greta? What? Oh, she works at, oh, the Museum of Art. So you can see that you donated to the Museum of Art, the donation. You can even track where from. So it came from your Park City condo. Maybe you were downsizing and you weren't taking care uh, and you wanted to send it over to Greta. Actually, if I go back into Greta's contact information, um, I can see that I met her at the Aspen Art Fair. And she told me that the museum has interest in a collection of oceanscapes. And here I have a perfect work to make that donation. I'm gonna click back into it. And there's the appraisal history information. If you're getting the works appraised that you can keep track of that. You can see that it is now at Museum of Art. 
And you can quickly filter and find the pieces that you have donated. So if you have to run a report, you can do so. For the receiving institutions, for the receiving institutions, the organizations, you can keep track of the donations that are coming into your institution. So if I click into this piece, the repast of the lion, I can see that it was donated by whom, Jack, the date for the value, and you can keep track of the attribution line. So, you know, not necessarily restriction, but part of the agreement may be, you know, how is this going to be conveyed in a label or pub uh, publicly facing on a public portal on your website? On the attribution line here is that it was donated in memory of uh, Jack's grandmother. And if I click into his contact record, I have, you know, all of his information. I have notes and I can see the works that he has donated. And then speaking of those additional funds that Tara mentioned, you can also, perhaps he gave additional revenue, right? For the preservation of the piece or the photography, the installation, the shipment, whatever it may, may be. So I just wanted to really quickly, you know, show that um, you know this information that's being shared in the presentation for both the donors and the collecting institutions is information that you don't want to lose. Um, it's really important because there's details that you don't want to lose track of. You want to have all of your information and documentation ready for tax day for the collectors and the artists. You also want to archive for your for your legacy. So what was your impact, right? And donations and charitable gifts are a piece of that. Now on the flip side for the receiving institutions, again, you don't wanna lose track of details or documentation. Um, you wanna have information at the ready to share with development, advancement, or the donor's family members, right? A decade or a few years um, after the, the donation, if there's any questions, if the donor has passed away. And again, you wanna preserve the legacy of your donors and the stories behind your collection. How did the pieces come in to your collection? These slides will be shared after the presentation. These are all hyperlinks I mentioned to articles. Uh, so for collectors, artists, institutions around charitable gifts, we also have a lot of content on appraisals, um, working with appraisers if you have questions about that. We also have just a lot of art inventory collection management articles on our blog. So feel free to check out the blog as well as we have other ways we can help. We have a newsletter that goes out every week with our new articles, these presentations, so you can sign up for them. Um, nonprofits, uh, speaking of the sliding scale, we offer a nonprofit discount here at Artwork Archive uh, so we can make our tools affordable. We also have video tutorials so you can learn more about our software. But I want to get into the questions because I see as I was talking, boop, 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 like the Q&A was, was filling, filling up. Um, so I'm going to stop my share and pull up some questions. Ah, a question uh, that Tara is responding to. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll let you respond to that, to that one. Great. Um, Elysian, can you? Sorry, add I was typing away there. <laughs> Perfect. Elysian, can you add more than one image for each piece? Yes, uh, you can upload up to 10 images per piece. So it can be a detail shot, it installed in the, the museum, um, a photo of the back of the, the work. Um, I, can add, I can speak to this question from Eleanor about charitable fundraising and I'll echo what, one of Michael's responses as well. You know, unfortunately right now as the rules stand, as Melissa mentioned, when you are an artist donating, you can only deduct your cost of materials. So even if it is for um, a fundraising event, your deduction is only the cost of materials. You know, the difference would be if um, you have sold the piece and then and then they donate, um, or even maybe a loophole is if you well, no, Sam, if, if, if like if you're represented by a gallery and the gallery owns the works and donate it because they're not the artist. But yeah, it really is only the cost of materials. That's really, really good to to clarify. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Steve shares a, a real scenario. Artists donate work for an auction fundraiser. The piece sells and the artist is given a percentage of the sale. Can the artist get the deduction for the other half? 
So that also plays into your answer about it's the, the cost of the materials. Melissa, do you have anything to add to this? This is a little outside my bailiwick. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it would be difficult. I, I think it's, you know, I think, you know, it's kind of like, I, I want to be able to say yes, but, um, you know, maybe there's a particular scenario and, you know, depending on very specific facts where that could happen, but I, I think typically um, it's not quite possible to, yeah, claim the deduction that way. Yeah. But it is very common, I know, for charity auctions, you know, where the artist will, uh, yeah, kind of get some proceeds back and, uh, you know, there's there's some other kind of arrangement there. Right. We'll be two, two more questions. Um, what are obstacles that could occur for artworks that are in storage, but there's not a designated trustee or entity mentioned for any artwork after the death of the owner? Um, I can answer that. Yeah so, yeah, so there's no plan in place, really. So the works are there. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, I guess, even if you didn't have a will, uh, you know, you'll still go to probate and, you know, somebody will be appointed to be an executor of your estate. And that person can then uh, go ahead and uh, you know, deal with the work as they see fit, uh, you know, whatever the state powers are uh, that apply to them, you know, in their role as executor. Um, if there is an executor or a trustee, but the artwork hasn't been directly addressed, um, you know, there's a kind of a, usually a tangible personal property provision um, that might deal with that, or there might just be some latitude there as well, um, depending on the language of the particular document. Great, thanks. One more question and we're at time, so we'll answer this question and and uh, say our thank yous. Uh, so Elizabeth asked, we or stated, we have people drop off objects, military collection, no artwork, and they often say we can sell this stuff if we like. These are things we don't want, don't accession, and we don't issue them a thank you letter or DOG. Is it okay for us to sell these I items, usually via eBay? These things are usually $50 to $500, and the donors, in quotation marks, are not usually interested in tax write-offs, but are just cleaning house. And she follows up with, I can't stress enough that the donation situation here is more like a thrift store than a museum. Um, I think the risk is pretty low here. Um, I don't know, Melissa, if you have any thoughts, I... Yeah, I'm... And I, I, I think I'm not sure I want to answer this. In this yeah, moment. okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the IRS, I can't see the IRS having time to figure out and and um, come after $50 donations like this. But as an attorney, I will say you should always follow the rules of the IRS. How about oh, that? Is it? This is being recorded, so... Yeah. <laughs> That, that was the advice from our, yeah. <laughs> our legal counsel um, on the panel. Yes, but that's it's a it's, it's a good question. And again, to Michael's point in the beginning, institutions of all sizes, right? Collections of all types, donors of all types. Situ um, so hopefully we you know addressed everyone's questions and needs. I love giving these educational webinars. It was such a treat to get to know Tara, Michael, and Melissa through this panel. I want to say a big thank you on behalf of the Artwork Archive team for your time. I've been seeing in the chat, everyone was loving this. Thank you to everyone who attended. Again, we will be sending the recording and the slides after the presentation. Um, feel free to share this with your, your friends and colleagues. We have more webinars coming down the pipeline. It's a pleasure to see you all in the webinar. Thanks again to our wonderful panelists. Enjoy your day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you.